so anyway, there's a couple things. You, you know I don't like Superman. I love Superman. I, I know. I know. And I'm sorry for you. But I, <laughs> but uh, there, okay. there are there are <laughs> there are a couple things about Superman that I really really like. Like I love the Phantom Zone. That's it's completely unique to anything else. I've never seen anything like that. I love that, and I love the uh, what's it called? His like Crystal Palace. Oh, the Fortress of Solitude. Oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. like in like Antarctica or something. Yeah yeah, it's it's really cool. So even though I hate. Superman as a character, <laughs> I really like the Phantom Zone, and I like the um, Fortress of Solitude or whatever you call You know it. why I like Superman so much? Please tell me. Like, real talk? Yeah, I'd love to know. Dude, when this UFO stuff happened when I was a little kid, um, I came home every day from school depressed. Mommy and Daddy are fighting. Damn. Dad's seeing whatever he's seeing. It's not real. It's demonic, whatever. And what comforted me for years was... Every day after school, I would watch Superman the Animated Series, Batman the Animated Series, Justice League the Animated Series, and Smallville. Oh, you were deep. Dude, dude, bro. I am, I'm literally trauma bonded to Superman. <laughs> yeah. That's the name Did of this I, episode, trauma bonded to Superman. Trauma bonded to Superman. Maybe, but, 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 but maybe that won't be the episode. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. We'll go from here, dude. Yeah. But um, yeah, Superman's the, he's the GOAT. And, um, uh, you know, I'm really into archetypes. I've talked about it on previous shows I've done before. I feel like in some weird way, it was meant to be that I would feel that connection to Superman because of the trauma that I experienced. I grew up feeling like there weren't other kids out there like me mm. in the same way, mm. you know, and think about it, man. I, I had this, you know, phenomenon basically wrecked my world and if you boil it down, Superman's archetype is like he's this lonely alien character who's trying to... Um, he's like burdened with great purpose. Yes. And, and he's like lives in a glass world and he, nobody else is like him. And no one else is like him, yeah. And, I, and to be honest, I grew up feeling that way, which is why I you know, felt that connection with Superman. Yeah, you know, um, I'll, I'll have to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Man of Steel was good though. You got it. No, it, it was it was it actually was really really good. Some of the yeah. later movies fell off for me, but you yeah. know, if you like them, that's cool. Yo, the Snyder yeah. cut, I liked it. I liked it. Yeah, I mean, it was it was better than the first. <laughs> the the Whedon cut. <laughs> yeah, and it's so tragic, like how all of that stuff worked out. But I'm super happy that they let. Snyder do his cut. Heck yeah. Dude. And I like Zack Snyder as a person. I think he's really cool. I also think he has made some really dope stuff. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I wasn't, you know, cri you, you, you want me to be honest? I think the thing that turned me off the most, it's so dumb, but like the 4 3 ratio thing, it really bothered me. Bro. It really bothered oh, me. Oh my God. <laughs> it did. I'm sorry. It's like, okay, we get it. Like you're trying to be Mr. Artsy Guy. And I know the whole thing about it, like, th they did it like that because it was optimized for IMAX or whatever, but yeah. I'm like, I'm not in an IMAX Did you theater. at least <laughs> see the scene with the flash with, like, the car crash? I, I went back and watched the whole thing. That was one of the best slow motion scenes I've ever seen it, in cinema. It, it oh was my God. awesome. All there right. were some really cool scenes in it. All right. So, um... We weren't planning on talking about any of that, by the way. <laughs> we just happened to do it. So, hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, everybody. So, here's what happened. We were like... How are we going to start the show? We don't have our little thing. Like, what's our catchphrase, man? Yeah. And we're like, you know what? Hit record. Yeah. And here we are. We just want to be meta and campy and, um, and, and super candid. So, I'm sure you're all wondering, did he check out Steven Universe? <laughs> <laughs> hey. I am about six episodes in. It's pretty cool. Let's hear it for Ryan. <laughs> It's pretty cool. It's basically these uh, crystals walking around with uh, consciousness, and they have, like, these magical powers. I mean, that's pretty cool stuff for a little kid's show. It is, and, and as the show continues, you'll, you'll learn it's not a little kid's show. I mean, it, it, it's like a Cartoon Network show, but it, it is packaged like a little kid's show, but it's actually, like, really not only mature, but, like, really metaphysical. Oh, yeah. Oh, meta? Oh! <laughs> metaphysical my favorite subject in all of reality which basically means um the hidden dimension you know 
Yeah. I'm all about the metaphysics, which brings me to our topic tonight. We're going to um, explore some metaphysical ideas that are very ancient. Ooh. So, so um, I don't know, man. You ready to get into it? I couldn't be more ready. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. All right, guys. So today we're going to talk about some pretty old ideas that I think are fascinating. Um, yeah, so have you ever heard of Gnosticism, Nick? I've... <laughs> I've heard you say Gnosticism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I but kinda... uh, I, I am super unfamiliar with what it is. Yeah. So Gnosticism is a really cool idea that took me down a rabbit hole um, of mystical traditions. So you know how I was raised. I mean, you know, you were raised the same way. We talked about it in episode zero. Um, the Christian thing. Now, for the audience who's not aware of this, when you're raised in the South in the Bible Belt, you are literally told you can't talk or think about ghosts, aliens. Oh, nothing. Nothing. It's a sin to even talk about it or think about it and, and believe it might be true because it's not in the Bible. The preacher didn't tell me, blah, blah, blah. How about this? Uh, just a quick little side thing. Uh, my cousin Garrett, you know Garrett. Love Garrett. Yeah, he grew up, uh, he grew up not believing in dinosaurs because they're not in the Bible. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that that's exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about. Like if it's not in the Bible, it's not to be believed. That's how kind of it is in the Bible belt. Now, I do want to say, just in case um Garrett's listening, we're not saying that Garrett is the problem here. The problem is no, of course the not. system and the way it teaches us when we're children. So despite the fact that my father had one of the most prolific contact cases in UFO history, and it totally just defied what we knew about religion and, and reality in general. Because of the way I was raised in the Bible Belt of the South, I still grew up very much um, clinging to that and this state of cognitive dissonance until I met um, Diana Walsh Pasolka. Yeah, I've read her book, American Cosmic. Yes, and then she introduced us to Dr. George Zervos from University of North Carolina, Wilmington. He's this really awesome scholar of religion, and he said the word Gnosticism to me, and I'm like, what the heck is this? I didn't really think that much about it. And um, so take a step back, 2012, my dad has this encounter with the lady, which again, you know, as far as my dad is concerned, we're going to go more into that later. But just as a little um, brief mention, the lady is this entity that my father saw and she basically gave the name Hathor. She told him that the hidden wait, wait, one... Wait, what do you mean gave the name Hathor? Like she told him her name is Hathor. Oh, 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 she told your dad yeah. that her name is Hathor. Yes, Hathor? this entity, Hathor? Hathor, yeah, like from Egypt. And she said, the hidden one is Amon Ra. And I'm like, what the heck is this? You know, I yeah. grew up a Christian seeing UFOs and having a documentary about it. It was just this mind-blowing conundrum that, that, that I, I had to figure out what it all meant. And then, you know, fast forward, after the lady experience, we met Diana Pasolka. I know I'm, I'm backstepping here, but... So then I meet George, and we start talking Gnosticism, and it totally just blew me away. And I looked into it a little bit. I thought it was cool. Then I went to college um, and studied religion started to break open the Gnosticism subject at, from an academic perspective. Now, so what Gnosticism is, is in 19, I believe it was 1952, some kids were playing in the desert or something in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, and they broke open these clay pots, and they found these scrolls. What? Called the Nag Hammadi Scrolls. And so they, this was like a random, like, kids found? Yes. They, oh. Yeah, they literally found some clay pots in the desert, and when they opened them, they were... Um, they were like texts about the life and the story of Jesus and the disciples, but they're very different to the books that the Vatican put in the Bible. They're, they talk about like reincarnation, um, how reality is this consciousness simulation, basically. Oh, that's epic. Yeah, and it took me down this rabbit hole of understanding that it's okay to study things outside of the box of Christianity and you probably won't burn in hell forever. And that, that <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was the way I was raised and that cognitive dissonance was very powerful. So I had to overcome it, you know, and um, I'm gonna be honest with you, man, seeing UFOs as a child and then going to church and being told that the UFOs are evil. It's like, it does something to your brain where you're like, it's I like gotta... a direct, well, because of how it is in the South, it's like a direct like contradiction or like a juxtaposition. Like these things should cancel each other out you know what i mean they should contradict each other directly but yeah but yeah. it's like you know what you know what's really funny man i was actually seeing the ufos and then everyone telling me that i wasn't and then i was a liar i was crazy or my dad was crazy or whatever it's like i don't know i believe what i'm seeing over what you're telling me and you haven't seen it 
Yeah. So from a young age, from 13, 14, 15, whatever, I developed this kind of, um, how can I say it? I don't trust what people tell me at face value. I'm going to figure it out on my own because everyone told me what I experienced was not real, but it was real, you know? Yeah, you're you're very like inquisitive in that way. You're very you're a, you're a true blue researcher. Like you you got interested in like ancient religions and stuff and not just like researched it on your own. You went to school for it. You you yeah. minored in it. Mm -hmm. You literally got a minor in it. Mm -hmm. Because of that. So let's get a little bit into Gnosticism. So, um, so it's the Greek word gnosis, which means like the knowing, like the inner knowledge. And the whole idea behind it is basically once you learn, this is from like the text. Like if you read all the Nag Hammadi scrolls and you kind of uh, synthesize. That's what they're called, the scrolls. Yes, that... the Nag Hammadi scrolls. It's like N-A-G-H-A-M-M-A-D-I. If you read them all and kind of analyze Dang, the meaning, you you pulled that out of a hat. You had that. Oh yeah, dude, I'm a research addict. <laughs> so, um, if you compile all the different like sects of Gnosticism, the whole premise is like, look, man, the real story of Jesus, according to these scrolls, the real story of Jesus is he showed up. He was telling everybody this is basically like a simulation, and um, the only way to wake up from it is to learn that you're in a simulation. And like, there's the whole divine feminine thing. It's called Sophia. Um, that's something I also have no idea. I don't know what. I mean, I've heard the divine feminine, the divine whatever, the the female. You know, I don't. I have no idea what that is. Yeah. Well, it gets interesting because when you break into the history of Gnosticism, they were influenced by the Neoplatonists, which is a reference to the um, the philosopher who's literally one of the most famous of all time. Oh, Plato. Oh, Plato. And then the deeper you dig into it, you find that. Um, the Neoplatonists are the ones who wrote the Gospel of John. What? Yeah, and what? you find out when you when you study the Bible from an insane. academic perspective that it's it's not like all written by people who are divinely inspired by God. It's actually written by like different groups of people, like Jewish mystics, Neoplatonists, um, uh, like rabbinical. Jewish Christians, meaning like more Torah focused, like the book of uh, Matthew is more Torah focused, whereas oh. the book of Luke is more Gentile focused. There's so many differences in what the Vatican gave us. And I, in my opinion, they probably think that no one would ever notice it. I don't know. Yeah. But um, when you break it apart and, and you compare it to the early history, there's a lot of evidence that the real man Jesus was probably talking about reincarnation. That's so yeah, cool and, because it's so the opposite of what, you know, we're meant to believe. Yeah. And, and, I guess what I'm getting at here is when I found out about Gnosticism, it just took me down this rabbit hole that released that cognitive dissonance that I had about the old-fashioned, like, old-timey Southern Christianity in which I was raised. Um, and then you get into, I, I'm just, like I said, I'm a research addict, and I, if I research a topic, I have to research everything there is about it until I feel like I sufficiently understand it, and then I feel like I, you know, have to move on. And I started researching reincarnation in the early, like, uh, not the first century, but as far as Christianity is concerned, like, was there historical evidence of reincarnation? And if you Google oh. Emperor Justinius, or it's Justinian, I can't remember the name, but Emperor Justinius, it's about 545 AD. This is real um, human history that the emperor banned reincarnation by penalty of death. If you, what? If, yeah, because at the time, the Christians... Uh, Did where, you say in the 540s? Yes. Like five, the five, like the year 540? Yes. God. This is when there was an emperor and a pope at the time. And then eventually they're like, you know what? We don't need an emperor anymore. The pope will be the emperor and it'll be this like godly religious figure. But and, Well, that'll work out. Yeah. In reality, it's a ruler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, so they, they, there's actually real historical evidence that the Christians of the time before the 540s we're teaching reincarnation. The Gnostic scriptures talk about reincarnation. It's like, if you think about it, th this was a historical cover-up that Jesus probably was teaching reincarnation. So then uh, the Pope in that era and the, like, the Christian movement were all teaching it, and that's why they outlawed it, because the emperor basically said, hey, I mean, we got a bunch of people walking around and believing in Jesus and teaching reincarnation. Um, we don't want them to believe that there is a power higher than the emperor. How can we come up with that? Yeah. The story goes, his wife was like, we'll just, you know, tell him there is no reincarnation or whatever. I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but. Oh, the emperor's wife? You're talking about the emperor's wife? Yes. If you, yeah. The history behind that is that the wife of Emperor Justinius was 
knew how to manipulate the people. And she's like, if you oh. if you want to be more powerful in the eyes of people, just ban reincarnation, because he didn't like the idea that the Christians were so fanatical about what they believe. They, uh, you know, according to the Gnostic version, this is wow. not the canonical version that we're taught in church. That is wild. It's so starkly different than it, what oh, we're taught dude, in church. Oh, dude, it's starkly different. You know what happens when I talk about this stuff to my family? What? They cry and they say I need to go back to church. Yeah, it, that it, it, that's so sad. It's like, why? I mean, why does it have to be that way? You know what I mean? It, I don't know. It's disheartening. You well, know? we're in that age of Aquarius energy now where things are like, <laughs> <laughs> where things are going to open up and they're going to change. Yeah, things are a lot looser uh, yeah, these days, so. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot more to Gnostic. I, I, I don't want this to be a lecture. Like, <laughs> yeah, but I, mean, I genuinely had no idea what that even was or, or, or any of that. So that's like, that's just so shocking that there are texts, historical texts that have been found that describe Jesus talking about reincarnation. I mean, it just, it, it, you know, it's so shocking because it, it is the complete opposite of what I've been told my entire life. And so I can imagine when you first discovered this, it probably blew your mind wide open. Well, we're sitting here talking about it today, man. This is about <laughs> 10 years ago that I found this stuff. Well, a little oh. after, but yeah, it blew my mind. Um, and it doesn't only talk about reincarnation. I mean, it talks very bluntly about this cosmic, oh, dude, we got to get into this a little bit. So this was taught to me by Dr. Um, George Zervos, who's a very good family friend of mine. Basically, he's Greek, by the way. Like, hey. you, like he's, 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 he's. Greek represent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nick, Nick is totally Greek. Yeah. My name is Nicholas Fermanidis. My name has like 10 syllables in it. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, nobody can ever get it right, man. Yeah, yeah. My, my full name. Yeah, but um, do you remember last week when we were planning out some of these topics and I was talking to you about the mind and the logos? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so George, the same scholar who taught me about Gnosticism, he taught me about that. And so for the listener who's, who's not really savvy with this stuff, here's some of the things I began to notice when I studied the Bible from an academic perspective. Um. In the Gospel of John, it's it's probably the most prolific gospel. Like if you, you know, Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, whatever, these very famous <laughs> preachers. <laughs> dude, it's the Bible Belt. But um, what they always say is like, if you're new to the Bible, <laughs> <laughs> read the Gospel of John. So you break open the Gospel of John. What does it say? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Um, it's something like that. I yeah, don't, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. verbatim. Right. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, of course. It's, yeah. That's one of the most quoted Bible verses, at least like around where we live. Yeah, and it says word, word, word. Word. Well, if you talk to a religious scholar, you will learn that the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, which was the, like the common tongue of the Hellenist. Ooh. Hellenist, for, for those who don't know, Hellenist means um, Greco-Roman assized. I kind of added that on as a little effect there that's not a real thing but you know the time was hellenistic like yeah. the greeks and uh they influenced all cultures right oh yeah in including like say it again for the people in the back yeah the greeks <laughs> influenced <laughs> everyone thank you you're welcome but you know who influenced the greeks who the egyptians we're gonna get into that Ooh. we're that, that's that's part of the topic <laughs> but anyway so um this is what dr george zervos taught me was when you translate the true translation of in the beginning was the word, the, the actual ancient Greek word was logos. And if you understand the true translation and transliteration of the word logos, it actually means like the mind, the divine mind, the divine archetype, the divine intellect, what these people, and remember I said earlier about 15 or less minutes ago that the Neoplatonists, yeah, yeah. literally Platonic philosophers, Greeks, Greek thinking people wrote the Gospel of John, which is the story of Jesus, right? Like there's a, already a so, disconnect there. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Anyway, what they're telling you is in the beginning was the mind, it's, and the mind was God, and the mind was with God. And this is like some rabbit hole type scholarly research stuff. Like you, you have to get into translation and codices and things like that. Um, it makes that verse so much cooler. Oh, dude, wake up. So much cooler. Like, I want that tattooed on my face. <laughs> you, know what, you know what the Gnostic tradition, like, again, the Gnostic tradition meaning 
the secret scrolls of Jesus that were found that are outside of the canon of the Bible, but they tell, dude, they're dated to be as old as the Gospels, the Gnostic scriptures. Wow. They're literally as old, but you know what? In the time, if you look back in history, people who spoke of Gnosticism were like basically slaughtered, like heretics. Wow. Yeah. That wasn't the state-sponsored version of Jesus. What right. We, what we, if you want to be real, dude, Christianity as it is today, I love Jesus. I think he's awesome. I think he's, you know, the most bad to the bone sage that ever lived. But if you if you want to be real, dude, it's like corporate Jesus. Oh yeah, like cookie cutter, like corporate. A, yeah, it's corporate. The yeah. Re- yeah. Anyway, it's like an abridged version. Yeah, it's an abridged version. So if you understand what the Gnostics were saying, it's basically there's this cosmic mind. It's this. Um, infinite, immortal, fractal intelligence that we are all a fraction of. We are all a shard of. So if you fractured my brain. (laughs) (laughs) That's incredible. Do you know who else said this? Who? The Orphics, who taught about Dionysus. Which is my favorite Greek god. Yeah. I think you know that. I do know that. Do you know who else taught this? Who? The Hermetists. Hermeticism, the Egyptians. So what we're, what we're understanding here from research, the story of Jesus, the true story of Jesus, as I understand it, as I think I understand it, is a very, uh, how can I say it? It's a, it's, it's a very um, borrowed concept that comes back from ancient Egypt. It's, it's put it this way, dude. I got to think about how to say this. Is it like the modern, are you saying like the modern Jesus is like a, like a mixed bag of like a bunch of different religions or is it, is it like specifically just from ancient Egyptian? Let's put it like this. So the apostle Paul, right? Yeah. Yeah. He wrote, as we understand, he wrote the majority of the new Testament. Then if you study religion from a scholarly point of view, you get into the concept that Paul actually wrote about six out of the 13 books that he was supposed to have written. He didn't even write the 13 letters from Paul. That's, that, that, uh, that's, that's fraudulent claims. What, really? Yes. From an academic perspective. And in the time, this was a Hellenistic period where this was a Greek thing. You could, you could like, like say I'm Plato, right? All right. You're Plato. Bet. <laughs> and I have a disciple. I die. That disciple, in the time this was accepted culturally, um, that disciple could carry on my teachings and use my name for like the credibility. And that's Whoa. what was done with the letters from Paul. So we're going to take a little bit of a step back. Okay. I know this is kind of all over the place, but you know, we're getting, so, we're getting started, bro. Dude, it's so we're, we're learning. interesting, though. Like, you're blowing my mind apart right now. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Like, really? Yes. Heck this yeah. is this is like I don't know, I just find this to be some of the most interesting thing stuff to talk about. And I think it's particularly because Dude, we, you're you know, Greek. Our, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, I'm pretty um, pretty proud of my seven percent Greek that Oh my God. <laughs> Bro. So Nick has Nick's identity is being. Oh my God! Are you really? We're going there. We're going there. (laughs) there. there. (laughs) So Nick's whole identity is being Greek, and like he looks Greek. Your family, your grandfather looks Greek. I have dark. I have dark hair. I have brown eyes. You have olive skin. I have a fat Greek nose. I'm yeah. I have olive. You have mildly olive colored skin. In addition to that, I mean, I was raised Greek. You have a yaya, baba, like everything is Greek in your family. Bro, he <laughs> he took Ancestry.com this year, and it literally came back. He's like 6% Greek. It, <laughs> Dude, it's closer to 7. It, okay? is, it is closer it's to like 7. It's like 6.8. I'm just saying, I man, need that I, extra 0.8, bro. I, yeah, it turns out I'm like 30% Scottish, which is just like so boring. <laughs> what? It's boring. I mean, it's like 30% Scottish, like 21% Irish. Who? Oh, hey, hey, hey. you better calm down, dude. I'm yeah, 96% Irish and English. Well, that explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I love all of our, our, our listeners. If you're Irish, that's cool, too, but I'd rather be Greek. Dude, it, it is pretty cool. It, it, it's pretty awesome, man. I, anyway, <laughs> yeah, so the whole thing there is literally I've known this guy. How long did we know each other again? Was it like something like 15 we, years? I think we may have said about 14 times in episode zero 
that we've known each other 15 years. <laughs> For 15 years, this man's identity has been that he's Greek. <laughs> and then we find out, like, three months ago, he's 6%. That's dude. just the funniest <laughs> thing. <laughs> you can't let me have this. No, dude, you have it. I you do. have all 6%, baby. All right. <laughs> 6.8. Oh, my Put God. some respect on the point eight. Okay, where were we, dude? You tell me. <laughs> Apostle Paul. Oh, this is relevant. So in the time, it was culturally acceptable to carry on your master's name and use it for basically oh, right, like right. clout, like, like scholarly clout. Hey. <laughs> hey. Hey. And that's what happened with the letters from Paul. All that stuff, like... Okay, so you got to understand, from a non-Christian perspective, they're probably like, what does any of this matter? So... Let's take another step back. The whole canon of the New Testament is like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's literally four books about the guy. And then it's like the rest of them are written from other people. And the Apostle Paul is the most important somehow. But like he was slaughtering the Christians and he was a Roman. But like he's the number one disciple. It's it's really historical mumbo jumbo that it would take a long time to explain. But what Paul did, and this is an academic a uh, point of contention. I didn't just like come up with this theory. I was taught this. And uh, I mean, it makes sense if you study the history. What Paul did was he took the original teachings of the man Jesus and he turned it from Christianity, meaning at the time they were walking around teaching people like, love God, love yourself, do good to your neighbor, like help them, whatever. And he turned it into Christology which means worship of Jesus as a God. I've never even heard that term. Oh, n- most people haven't. Dude, I study this stuff night and day, and it blew my mind when I heard that. So the Apostle Paul is single-handedly responsible for turning... Like, here's what really happened. Jesus walked around. He, you know, supposedly did miracles, which, I mean, I believe miracles, they happen around us. Oh, yeah, all You know, the time. like, I, I believe it's very possible. Synchronicities are kind of Synchronicities like... are a miracle. Yeah, yeah this, this yeah. stuff was 2,000 years ago, so a lot of it could have been um, fluffed up, embellished, whatever, but, like, anyway, there's something special about this guy that I felt like I had to figure it out. And the, the corporate Vatican version is you have to confess... Because of what the Apostle Paul said in Romans, I think it was like 10.9 or 9.10. If you do not confess with your mouth out loud, audibly, that you believe that Jesus Christ uh, was born of a virgin and he died on a cross and he resurrected after three days. If you, if you don't like say that at some point in your life, you will burn in hell eternally. That is what is the canon of the Bible. Jeez. But that's not what the real dude was saying. If you look at even what he said in the Gospels, and then you get into the Gnosticism and the Hermeticism and the other like historical accounts, he would, bro. Okay, okay. So you're saying that that's not what like the actual Paul was saying. You're saying one of his disciples or whatever was using his namesake. What I'm trying to say is that there is a difference between the true history of 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 ancient knowledge and wisdom, Jesus and the ones before him. There's a true version, and then we have, like, the corporate version that keeps us in line and doesn't allow us to question anything outside the box. The real Jesus, what did he do? He challenged the corporate people, dude. They were, like, making money. They turned the temple into basically a bank and a market, and he got mad as hell, and he's like, kicked them and flipped their tables over, and then they killed him, you know? And then they turned his story into this uh, mithraic, like, Jesus is a god. I don't know that word. It's, it was the Roman <laughs> Roman mystery cult, Mithra. Like the this messianic, like, well, false messianic, like... You do, oh, oh, That's okay. another okay. episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, you go ahead. That's another episode. But what, anyway, what I'm getting at is stumbling upon Gnosticism has opened this huge rabbit hole to where I've come to understand that what has been crammed into my soul since I was a child in the Bible Belt is not the true history. Um... The real Jesus, there is much historical evidence that he was walking around talking about reincarnation, consciousness, like literally the cosmic mind. It's this fractal, like you're a part of the spark of God. Guess, and, and people were saying that before him. So like, cool. The Dionysian tradition, they were talking about, what's the story of Dionysus? He's like this twice-born God. Um, he, uh, I got to gather my thoughts here. He, you can help me with the story of Dionysus, but basically, like he was killed, right? Yeah, the, the, yeah. Just a very basic version, and then he was resurrected, um, and like the ashes of the Titans are like bonded with him somehow, mm-hmm. and now he's like twice born. And the point, from an esoteric point of view, of Dionysus thing is 
we have that spark of the divine and we reincarnate. Guess who else says things like that? Egypt. That's so Guess dope. Guess who else? So uh, dope. Osiris. So what I'm trying to say is Jesus is an archetype of a much older tradition. So then, like, Jesus, Dionysus, Osiris. Same thing. What? Yes. That is that's so what I'm crazy. Tra- that, 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 that's what I'm coming to understand. And that's, I guess that's something you could literally only know if you, like, did the legwork. Like, if you did the, the hardcore digging. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, dude. Now, I didn't even mention this. Um, what really kicked this off for me was I had a dream about Osiris. And I think I remember, I think go, go for it. Yeah. This is so, a cool story. Yeah. I was, you know, I was dreaming and Osiris, this Egyptian deity, and, you know, it's just like this metaphorical depiction was standing at the foot of my bed and he was saying something to me, but I didn't know what he was saying. And then I, the dream switched and there were frogs hopping around my room and I was chasing them and I was like, I, I really want to catch these frogs. And I finally caught one and then it died in my hands and then it was reborn. And I woke up the next day and I was like, this was a crazy dream. It's the only dream in my life that I obsessed so hard about that I, it, you know, I like, it, it changed me. That's poetic. It changed me. And when I looked into it, um, I started learning about how the story of Osiris is very ancient. It's, it's approximately 7,000 years old. Whereas remember Jesus story is 2000. Yeah. The story yeah, of yeah, Osiris yeah. is roughly 7,000 years old in the book of the dead. And it's the same concept. He's a shepherd. He has like a crook and a flail where his, it's, it's shepherd symbolism. He, um, dies and then is descends into the underworld and then he's reborn. And it talks about reincarnation. A lot of the same stuff as the Gnostic traditions. It, it, isn't it in the Bible? Like when Jesus died, didn't he like, didn't he apparently go to hell? Yeah, yes. For like yes. Three they days say he went something? to hell for three days. That's the corporate version. Right. right, right. <laughs> the Vatican <laughs> myth version. Part. Yeah. And, and just to be clear here, I, I, I don't, I hope I, um, don't come off as anti Catholic. I am very anti, uh, corporate Vatican. I'm very anti-institution. Love Catholics. I got a Catholic yeah, sit co- in the room with me right now. Yeah, of course. Love you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you, Alex. yeah. So, um, that went a little out of the box from what we planned. But, but it was that's the, like the most epic. It's so epic. It's all so cool. What I am trying to tell the world, like, if someone had a gun to my head and they're like, "What's the last thing you're gonna say?" <laughs> About this topic. You, you know those, you know those scenarios. Oh, when, dude, they're real. That, they're real in movies. <laughs> no, okay. But, but like, okay, I, I have a finger gun in my head. If I had a gun to my head and they're like, what's the last thing you're going to say about this topic <laughs> to clear it up and stop rambling, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that what we know about religion is wrong. And I think because of the age that we're in and like especially the lights that my family and many others have seen uh these these real whatever they are these entities orbs and yeah, orbs yeah. Just, yeah there's there's something um i think as we go deeper into the age of aquarius which we are now in uh more truth more mystical more more spiritual scientific uh, the deeper truths of reality that we've wanted to know i think they're going to be brought to light and we're going to find out that history pretty much was only written by the victors, including religion. Which is traditionally yeah, I mean, yeah, dude, how it happens. The Bible came out in like the 300s. Um, I think it came out in Africa, if I remember correctly from my religious studies. It, it, it wasn't just like these books were just passed around by Christians. No, it's like they had councils. The Romans had councils. And they're like, yo, let's figure out how we want to tell this story to the world. We'll just give them these 66 right. books. It was, Dude, it, there's thousands in, in the Vatican. I have scholar friends who have access to the secret Vatican archives. Dude, like there's, bro. Is the book of Enoch and stuff like that in the- That's the Dead the, Sea Scrolls. Okay. That's a totally different thing. Okay, And, and okay, that's, okay. that's just as old, um, supposedly. But th- yeah, this is a different archaeological dig entirely. Oh. Um, and uh, where was I? Oh, Dude, there's a secret gospel of G- James, the brother of Jesus. There's a secret gospel of wow. uh there's a secret gospel of John. It's called the Apocryphon of John. There's a secret gospel of Jesus. 
they're, they're called this in the Nagamati Scrolls. Like literally the ancient writers wrote the secret gospel or the secret revelation of John, the secret revelations of Jesus, the secret revelations of Mary Magdalene, the secret wow. revelations of Judas Iscariot, the secret, so on and so forth. It just keeps going. And they all tell these crazy stories. Like according to the Gnostic tradition, um, Jesus appeared. Oh, like he wasn't it born. It wasn't a virgin birth. It was like he appeared. You know, wow. there's so many different accounts of him and his life. Was, was he considered like a human then? I mean, no, I guess, I guess if he wasn't born. In then... scholarly terms, it's what's called a docetic appearance, which means he just sort of like poof. He just like materialized and he's here. Now, naturally, I don't believe that happened. But what I'm getting at is the four gospels we have about Jesus and then literally the rest of the New Testament that just talks about people that are talking about him. It's it's crammed to us as true, and like the whole world tiptoes around yeah, it's this package belief. the exact way that they want us to ingest the it. The whole world tiptoes around thinking outside of the box and trying to challenge what they think they know. When I was 13, I saw lights. They showed up on my property. Everyone told me it was evil. It was demonic. But the beings literally face-to-face -face looked at my dad and said, we are the guardians of nature. We work for God and creation. And uh, by the way, the hidden one is Amun Ra. Uh, you know, they told your dad that, yes, too. Yes, yes. So in addition to the lady telling your dad that. Well, uh, that's complicated. I didn't want to get into the full story, but okay, when, okay. My, when my cool. dad saw the lady, there were three beings of light, and they all kind of said things to him. Yeah, I, yeah. I know that's weird, but whatever. This is weird. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's all really this, hard. You, know, this is weird. you want to be real for a second? I'd like to be real for a second. It's really hard to look people in the eyes and be like, you know, oh, dude, the craziest thing happened yesterday. I was laying in bed and an entity walked up and touched me and then poofed away. <laughs> you know how hard it is to tell people that? It's pretty hard. But, you know. You said you said something. What was it? Hermeticism? Oh, yeah. So, What's, perfect. You bring me to the next topic. What, what is, um, hermeticism. I don't know anything is about that. even potentially older than Gnosticism. So, when you get into that, oh, my God, dude, this is an even bigger topic. It's crazy. So, everything that you think you know about secret societies, like, oh, Illuminati, whatever, Freemasons, Rosicrucians, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, by the way. Hermetic. Hermetic. Every single one of these, quote, enlightened secret societies, bruh, they study Hermeticism. Really? It's not It's all that, the same. It's all the same. Like, you want to know the secret? Guess what, world? You just learn the secret of the Freemasons and all these people. It's Hermeticism. <laughs> That's it. Google it. You have the knowledge. You have the secret teachings that have been passed. Uh, the secret teaching of all ages. Hey, you know what? Rather than people Googling it, we should do like an episode of the podcast about it. Dude, we're right now doing that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Hermeticism is awesome. Um, it's the... So... There's a mix of legend and then real recorded history that's kind of difficult to navigate unless you, you know, look into it quite a bit. You can't just accept everything you read at face value because, again, in, in some of these time periods, it was common to, you know, claim you're somebody just for the clout and you, you got to really sort of suss out the historical. I love that you're using all of these like millennial terms. <laughs> in, suss out. <laughs> in, 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 suss out. Uh, yeah. Like all these millennial Dude, terms. To, I'm a millennial. To, to refer to like thousands of years ago, these people, I, I'm just imagining these people yeah, being like, you... Dude, I was totally sus, bro. <laughs> 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 <Bruh>, I was bugging. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, dude. Okay. You want to know something funny, man? Yeah. According to the book of Mark, the very first miracle that Jesus ever did. He was literally at a party and he turned water to wine. Bro. Oh yeah. <laughs> Dude, he was a party animal. <laughs> you know what? You know how I was raised? I was raised and, and my mom didn't say this or anything. It's just like, um, my dad never said this either. It's just in the Bible belt there, you, you know, everywhere you go, someone's a Christian and they always got to correct you or whatever. And like kind of throw it in your face. And the way that I was raised around family and friends and, and, and my version of Christianity was that they didn't drink wine. Oh, it, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. dude, it was grape juice. And f what? I'm telling you, man, I'm telling you, that's, Th that's the way what I they told you. Yes. That's what they told me. I was raised that in first century Judea, they were so apparently smart that they knew the science of fermentation and they could just like ferment fruit in their cellar in the desert, but somehow not make it alcoholic. 
What? Yeah, that that's they don't how, say it like that. They yeah. just say it's not wine, it's grape juice. That's how but, afraid people are in the Bible Belt. Like they won't even admit that someone in the Bible had alcohol. Or yeah, that or like all these little mini beliefs about it spring up that are actually anti to the Bible. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, where does it say that it was grape juice? It clearly says it was wine. Water to wine. That's, water to wine. That's yeah, what it at says. At a party. In every version you could read, it says turn water into yeah. turn water into wine. Yeah, and yeah, that's. I think I want to say the story is only in the Book of Mark, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, I just thought that was funny, man. Like my my idea in my head was that there's a story of humanity, right? That's different to what we're told by these corporate whatever. The, the, you know, the, the Vatican version of religion. Where was, oh, we're going back to Hermeticism. So Hermeticism is an even older version of that archetype. There's always this, there's always this archetype. Oh my God, dude, that's, that's a whole nother episode, but. Well, archetypes, like archetypes in general. Yeah. Cause you got to remember, man, the universe is a mind according to the book of John, right? Write it down. Somebody like, write like it down. The logos, <laughs> the universe is a mind. Well, if you look into Carl Jung and then you get into archetypes, that's like literally the animating forces behind the mind and the collective unconscious. Archetypes are very oh, important for sick. understanding reality, forces of nature, whatever. We're going to do an episode about that later. I think the next episode might be the mind. Hey. The psychic mind. Hey, I'm yeah. excited for that. I'm real excited. All right, so let's get into hermeticism. Yeah. So um, there's a guy in history called Hermes Trismegistus or Hermes Mercurius Thoth. And it's this amalgam of um, the Greek Hermes, the Egyptian Thoth, and the Roman Mercury. And if you look at all three of those dates, and by the way, I should really take a step back here and say, if I'm talking about like Osiris, Hermes, Mercury, like I'm not some pagan that sits around and like believes <laughs> these gods are real. No offense to pagans or whatever. It's right. metaphor. Right. Yeah. You have to understand like metaphor and archetypes do something to on a reality level. It's it's meant for you to read and resonate with on an intuitive level. I don't I don't think that there's a guy with a bird head flying around. That's right. why I saw it in a dream and not with my eyes. When there I is there is in Smite, which is one of your favorite games. That but. is it is, and that's <laughs> literally the reason I could identify Osiris was because of that. Game. Oh, the, it, synchronicity. Oh, you bro. mean like in your dream? Yeah. Whoa. Because of the game, I knew the character. Anyway, so um, the idea of Hermeticism is that there are seven laws of reality. I wrote them down because it's it's kind of hard to quote right off the dome piece. He's pulling up that phone, y'all. Um, all right, so these are the seven <laughs> Hermetic laws. Law one, the universe is basically like the mind of God. It's all is mental, all is mind. N number two, um, the law of correspondence, as above, so below, as below, so above. Well, what, 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 what does that mean? Like okay, I'm so what that means, you ready to go deep, man? Ooh, let's do it. What that means is that the higher reality and the lower reality are twins they're mirror images so the state of your mind is the within because remember it says as above so below as within so without is also part of the quote the state of your mind is a mirror image of the state of the outside of your mind or like the oh. heavenly higher realms is a mirror image of the lower earthly realms but think even deeper like think Think in terms of fractal consciousness. Um, fractal consciousness, meaning what you were talking about before, where like everything is shared consciousness yes, kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, okay, frac okay. so fractal means, um, you know, in nature, there's this mathematical code. I learned about this in the Da Vinci Code, by the way. It's called phi, P-H-I. It, it's a Greek symbol. And um, I believe it's 1.68. I think it might, the math ratio might be like, two over three or something like that. And it is the mathematical code for in the infinity spiral of nature. Um, so basically fractal means in all directions, something is infinitely expanding and infinitely present. Okay. Okay. Right. Gotcha. So consciousness, the Gnostics taught this, the Egyptians taught this. So yeah. 1.168. That's, that's the, the, the golden, is it just 1.168? That's what I said. 618. 
We oh, just, my bad, my we, bad. Dude, I'm just, dyslexic. Guys, we just discovered live on the podcast that Ryan's dyslex- oh, dyslexic. Oh, dude, I've known him my whole And life. I can't even say the word. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so, really he, okay so the the whole, like, above, below thing is so think referring about this. to... So, so all the way up, think, 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 think universally, right? Okay. Like, you have a consciousness. You're Nick Fermanita. You're sitting here with me now, chilling. We're doing a podcast. Cool. You have your life. Yeah. You get up. You go to work. Uh, you know, before you go to work, you might brush your teeth, throw your shoes on, eat breakfast, and come home after work, go to bed, rinse, repeat. You have a job. You have a function. Yeah, right, right, in, right. In, in reality. You have yeah. a function in reality. So does the blade of grass, right? It's function. It has a job. Yeah. So to speak. We're, we're speaking metaphorically here. It wakes, right. I mean, it wakes yeah. up, produces chlorophyll, Whatever, the tree produces, whatever it does, oxygen, the white blood cell in your body, it has a job. It has a conscious, thoughtful process to protect Nick's body from antibodies, viral infections, whatever. Everything in nature, in some scale, has a conscience or a consciousness. Now, instead of going down and thinking about like how the atom on a molecular or on an atomic level vibrates to maintain the form of reality, let's go up. The star, the planet, the, um, the galaxy, they have a conscious role as far as reality is concerned. But see, we're so dumb in the West because of all this, like, you know, very forceful religious state that we're in. We don't think in terms of uh, consciousness. It's, it's fractal. So, like... Right. We're, we're all taught, like, we each have an individual spirit. And then like an individual soul, and then it goes. Nothing to the, else does. The, yeah, like the yeah. way I was raised, for example, because of my strict Christian background, like animals don't even have souls. I knew you were gonna say animals that. Animals don't have souls. And dude, as a kid, that would, that made me so sad. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. You know why animals don't have souls? Because in like the book of Genesis, it says something like uh, animals were put here for man to have dominion over, so they don't have souls. Yeah, it just seems and it's ridiculous. Like, that's, yeah, come on. It just you know? seems... Re- I mean, it, even from a young age, I was like, that just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Dude, you know what the lady told my dad? But what? with the, Let's just bring it back. Why I think this way. The lady told my dad, um, even the blade of grass has a consciousness. Everything has a consciousness. Like verbatim? Like, yes. Just, wow. Yes. The blade of grass has a consciousness. Everything does. And, like, I guess that's something I'll have to get into at some point. But a lot of these things yeah. that I have... Um, come to believe have been because of entity interaction. The wow. next law, so just to summarize correspondence, that's a very difficult one. It, you have to understand fractal consciousness and that will make sense. The higher realms and the lower realms are mirror images, basically. You know, as you go higher yeah, no, up in it, reality, everything has a conscious role, a conscious awareness, a contra, up, conscious observation, even on an atomic level. Everything is conscious. Everything has thoughts. Everything has perception. The table has perception on a vibrational level. As above, so below. Um, yeah, I hear the you, I hear the term. You know, I hear like yeah. as above, so below, but I didn't understand it until now. That is so profound. Oh, dude, it's one of the most profound statements ever written in mankind's history. That's epic. Yeah, as above, so below. Um, the next hermetic principle, everything is vibration. Um, that one's common sense. That's actually in science that's known as the Brownian movement. Everything at a molecular level vibrates. Oh, okay. If so it that... didn't vibrate, it would be zero degrees Kelvin and it would sub- hypothetically cease to exist. Um, everything has polarity. That's the fourth one? Or this is the, the same? Now, this I'm is... just moving on. I'm oh, moving gotcha, on. Sorry. Gotcha. The next law, polarity. Everything is dual. What does that sound like? Um, the Chinese symbol. God, I'm blanking on the symbol, even though I know this. Yeah, Dao. Uh, Dao uh, the Dao. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, the the, the black and white symbol. Like the yin and yang. Yin yang, yin yang. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, I'm a dunce. <laughs> <laughs> you should just give up now. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> anyway, um, that symbol reflects that principle. Um, it's like for everything, there's an opposite. Yes, in nature, in reality, uh, for good there's evil, for light there's dark, for big there's small. This, hot and cold. Okay, hot and cold. Cool. Fundamentally, this reality is dual in nature and it's seeking balance. Ooh. Everything is seeking balance. Like what is, what is, uh, what do they say in star Wars, the force, everything is seeking balance. That's, that's some real metaphysical stuff. Like George Lucas is smart. Um, and let's see, everything has this pair of opposites like, and unlike are the same. They're identical in nature, but different in degree. So like, for example, um, cold is not a thing except the absence of heat. 
evil is not a thing except oh. the absence of good or love. Dark is not a thing but Ex- the absence of light. Right. Wow. That's just how, you know, the higher up you go in consciousness, the more you're, you're, um, the more you resonate with the higher end of that dual paradox. That's badass. Yeah. Everything. Okay. Next law. Everything has gender. Everything in reality has gender, meaning, uh, even plants have male and female species. Right. Um, you know, creative and destructive forces in nature. Everything in some fundamental reality level has a gender that serves a purpose. That's actually a deep mystery. The mystery of the two, I believe in, in the hermetic order of the golden dawn. Anyway, next law, everything has a rhythm. Everything has a rise and fall. And, and, and again, this, these are principles about reality. This is Egyptian reality principles. This is like these people sat around and they thought, what are the seven laws of nature and reality itself? That's what this is talking about. And the final law, cause and effect. So for everything, there's a cause and effect. That's karma. Now, why are those laws relevant? Because every secret society that's ever in, in, uh, influenced pop culture believes in this. Any of those Aleister Crowley, whatever mumbo jumbo occultists are out there who've been given like this powerful, scary identity, uh, this is what they believed. This is what they used to alter their consciousness and manipulate reality in some way. It all comes back to hermeticism. It may very well be the original doctrine. Hermeticism? From, yes. Like hermeticism? Yes, like from the times of Atlantis. Mm-hmm. Like it could be, like, is hermeticism considered a religion or is it like a... Like, I wouldn't call it a religion. I would call it more like... Like a thought... Uh, yeah, like, like, like a... Like a uh, I don't know how to describe like a philosophy. Oh, okay, yeah. It, it, it's not really religion. It doesn't require worship. It, it, it it's just um, it's just like an understanding of reality. It's more like the spiritual science. Ooh, okay, cool. Actually, cool, funny cool, cool. story. I studied under a Rosicrucian who taught spirit science, and it was all hermeticism. It was all understanding reality itself, and that's when I got onto like the the um. He he taught me about crystals and all that stuff. It sounds wacky at first, but it's actually it's not. Well, um, I mean, look if you if so if you follow that everything has a consciousness, mm-hmm. everything has a frequency, a vibration, and everything, and energy. Then, then why, you know, why is that so kooky to think about, like, crystals can affect you, can, can have an effect on you, even yeah. just them being in your vicinity or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, if you follow this stuff through, it's not so crazy to think. Yeah, no, not at all. And um, it, it all goes back to supposedly the Emerald Tablets of Thoth which I had some notes about when the Emerald Tablets of Thoth believed to be found by Apollonius of Tyana, but it, it might really be a compilation of much older philosophical systems. There's a concept in philosophy, religious studies, whatever, called the Prisca Theologia, which is the idea that somewhere in this reality that we share, there is one true, like, secret doctrine that influences all religions, and kind of hermeticism might be that. Be that. It might be that original doctrine if you study. There's a mix of folk tale about it. There's a mix of history, but it's very fascinating. All these uh, very insanely powerful people, these secret societies, Freemasons, whatever, they all believe this. They use this. They study this. They live this. Something about Hermeticism is so valuable to powerful, rich, and um, uh, influential people to where I have paid attention. I just, you know. Anyway, Plato. Plato is probably the first person in human history who ever made mention of Atlantis. And, and so Plato lived around 400 BC, something like that, 500 BC, maybe 450, you know, years before Christ. And um, Plato wrote these things called diatribes, right? Okay. So diatribe means I'm writing a story about two characters that are having an argument. But remember, he was a philosopher. He wasn't like some fiction writer trying to sell and make a buck. That well, wasn't a thing right. back then. Yeah, yeah. When people wrote something, it was like to alter consciousness, and especially in Greece and Egypt. And he wrote a story about 
uh, Socrates, which by the way, Socrates was not a real person. He was a character of Plato's. Yeah, wasn't he? What do they call that? Wasn't like, like Shakespeare is supposed to be that too? There's like theories that Shakespeare wasn't a real person. It was like a right. Um, yeah, I they, forget, they say I it's the a group for, of people. Yeah, like a group of people, or yeah. uh, if there's a term for it. I'm just blanking I don't, on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, Socrates was a character in Plato's writings, and he wrote a story of Socrates having a conversation with Solon. And in the story, when Solon is talking to Socrates, he makes a comment, something to the effect of the Greeks learned all of their ancient knowledge from the Egyptians who learned it from the Atlanteans, right? That's where I was trying to get to. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. cool, cool. Yeah, so Plato in early 400 BC, whatever, r- talked about Atlantis um, in his story and talked about the Egyptian priests learning from Atlantis, okay? So the Emerald Tablets of Thoth are also known as uh, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean. Right. And and traditionally is Thoth like an Egyptian figure? Yes. Okay, okay. Yes, okay. it's the bird headed whatever. Or you could think about it as thought, because we're all thoughts in the mind of God. That's Ooh. kinda like some esoteric stuff. But so what I'm getting at is that's part of the folklore of Hermeticism, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. It's like were they real, were they not real? I don't know. But there's this syncretistic view of humanity's religious history. Now, when I say that, I mean um, you can look at religions from a historical perspective and sort of analyze them and synthesize uh, 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 connections between them, that there might be bits of truth in all of them, like Zoroastrianism, Hermeticism, uh, the Neoplatonists, Jesus and the Gnostic stuff, the Tao in China. They're all related. They, they, they all have parts of this doctrine. They're all teaching something similar. Um, the folktale and the history are intertwined, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Hermes Trismegistus, if you study history, he may well have been Enoch in the Bible, like the real person Enoch. What? What? what ha- I mean, if if he was even a real person. But what's the like? Where does that connection come from? Because Enoch is like the grandson of Adam, right? No, 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 no. It, it would be it, according to the book. It's like great, great, great. No, it would be the great or great great grandfather of Noah. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So if you, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's, it's very hard to put into words because I usually don't have anybody to sit around and talk about this stuff with, <laughs> if I'm being honest. I've kind of always been that person for you anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's just, I just love hearing it. Yeah, but. Um, it's so epic. So there's a connection between, let me, let me see if I can get this right. Hermes. Trismegistus. It means thrice greatest. <laughs> That's epic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's a connection between him and that he could be Enoch. Could be Enoch. And then if you get into the Arabic stories of Enoch and like the keys of Enoch and things like that, they say that Enoch ascended into the angel Metatron, right? Well, if you go into the book, the Bible, Enoch ascended after walking 360 days with God or whatever, and then he was no more and he never died. So and that's where Metatron's cue? That's where, that's, me, that's where Metatron comes from. It's whoa. Enoch, Hermeticism, Hermes Trismegistus, Trismegistus you know, Thoth Greatest, uh, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. All these things are connected. Basically, you have to pull the strings about how these ancient systems are connected, and you'll find this big story... Basically, that they're all connected. It's all the it's all the same thing, or like certain pieces of all of them. It's obvious that it's like they're pulling from the same place. Or, or yes, they're all pulling from Egypt. Dang. Yeah. Does any of this make sense, or does it? No, sound- it absolutely makes sense. You're okay. just ripping my mind apart. Okay. Okay. For example, um, we're at an hour. Do you want to go just a couple more minutes? I mean, it doesn't have to be an hour flat, right? No, it totally doesn't. I mean, we can do however long you want. All right. Cool. For example, do you know where Satan comes from? The name. Isn't it something like Shaitan or something yes, like that? Yes, it's Shaitan, Shaitan. Shaitan. Is that a... Um, uh... That's a Persian. Oh, Persian. Okay. So the Persians who... I, I always thought it was like a Jewish or a, um, like something like that. Okay, Persian. Mm-mm. The Persians had the name Shaitan. They came up with that name to describe the Egyptian set. Oh. Which is the enemy of Osiris in that myth. Right. And there's always parallels between Set and Satan drawn anyway. So Yes. So... Pretty much if you pull apart everything, it all comes from Egypt. Like Western traditions, it all comes from Egypt. Um, Why do you think Aleister Crowley? Now, let me just throw out a disclaimer. I don't sit around and like claim Aleister Crowley is some enlightened dude. I think he's, he's, um, he was probably a plant to make a lot of this knowledge look crazy and vile and disgusting. Oh, you think so? Yeah, he mixed nuggets of truth in with like total 
piles of crap. <laughs> but, I, dude, my mind is so curious. I have to find all the similarities. I, I've read Alistair Crowley. I've read Elifus Levi. I've read, um, I haven't really read Helena Blavatsky. I don't, like, like these people or, you know, whatever. No, but I'm reading things, it all. It's it's that they are studying the same things that you're interested in. And, and so, I want to find out what they're saying about it and right. then what, you know, the Hermetic or the order of the golden dawn whatever but what i'm saying is you look at alistair crowley he has this egyptian crap on his head yeah yeah <laughs> uh the freemasons you watch a documentary about them they're talking about egypt they're talking about um the star sirius and how the pre- egyptian priests were into the stars it's all egypt it's all egyptian dude literally the being showed up to my dad yeah that the world already knows like we've had an encounter i'm just adding things that you, you might not have heard they literally showed up to my dad and they said the hidden one is amun ra the hidden one the hidden one and um, Hathor, the lady, and then I had the dream about Osiris. It's all Egyptian. It's yeah. Yes, it's all Egyptian. Because Egy- Egypt, according to Plato, Egypt was like the, the society that came after the fall of Atlantis. There's something about Egypt's history that we don't know. Like, old, like it may be way older than we think. Um, what? Yeah, like way what, older. What, dude, what, dude, the pyramids suggests, are very old. What suggests that it may be very much older than we think. There are extreme scorch marks on the top of the pyramids and other structures, like megalithic structures in Egypt. On the top of the outside of the... Yes, which only could be explained by catastrophic civilization destroying solar flares that would have reset life. That's the only way that you could explain these scorch marks that exist on these megalithic structures. But no one knows about this because they're, you know, they're not seeing beings of light in their backyard and then being so traumatized by it that they feel like they have to spend hundreds of hours trying to figure out. Yeah, you've kind of been like thrust into figuring all this stuff out. Yeah. But most people don't sit around and think, I wonder if there's like evidence of Egypt being really old. Most people don't care. Right. They would have no reason to look that yeah, up. M- but my jaw is on the floor. The- there are scorch marks on the... Yes, yes. Like, you can see them. I mean, you'd have to, like, climb. Right, right. But there's, okay, yeah. yeah, but yes, you can... <laughs> you can walk, they're, they're there. Like, I've, they're, my dad has shown me a dozen YouTube videos where they just have scorch marks on the top of the pyramids that could only be exp- explained by literally yeah, I mean, catastrophic solar flares. Yeah, yeah like, society be? may have been reset over and over and over and over. Earth is probably... Or, or, or so many civilizations have probably lived here as above, so below. As above, it, so it's below. It's the dying, like like Dionysus, like yes. Osiris, like yes. the rebirthing thing. The cycle of life itself even repeats. Oh my God, I just blew my own mind. You just blew oh your own mind, God. dude. You're a Greek philosopher now, brother. Wow, I have to, I have, to have a cooler name, though. <laughs> I don't think Nicholas. It's kind of, it's all right. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Nick Nicholese. That. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. But um, yeah, like that's that's kind of what I'm trying to get at is I am going to be very real with the audience right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a Christian. Yeah, me either. I am not a Hindu. I'm yeah. not an Egyptologist or whatever they would call. I'm not this or that. I am in search of the real truth. Yeah, yeah. Whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. I am finding that all of these ancient di- ancient traditions have an alternative version in history that we're not being told in the mainstream. You know, I'm trying to figure that out. I'm trying to see what really happened in the past from a different lens, you know, academic, scientific, psychological, legend, also real history. I'm looking at all angles here because yeah, it's also like you want to find out like why do they go to such lengths to cover it up? And But I know they do because when I was 13, I saw these beings of light with my family. You know, me and dad have seen thousands of lights in the sky or whatever. But it's, it was... It's just like you said earlier, who are you going to believe? The thing that's telling you what's real? Yeah. Or like the, the texts that have been curated and changed and, you know, over hundreds of years and... Thousands. Yeah, thousands of years. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you're going to believe your own firsthand experience. Here's let's let's just kind of like set the stage for the future of this podcast. My belief, we're gonna tie into the next episode here, and then and then maybe we'll come to a close. And I hope this doesn't sound what are incoherent. You a, what are you a professional podcaster or something, dude? Professional, <laughs> um, 
Why not, man? <laughs> I'm anything I want to be, I guess. Speak it into existence. Yeah, speak it into yes. existence. I'm a professional we podcaster. Are, we are professional podcasters, my friend. We are. Episode one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, but this this is what I believe. This is because of the life of contact that I've had, being face-to-face with entities, having um, psychic people basically foster psychic abilities within me and my family. That's a long story. Um, my belief is that this reality that we live in is a multiverse of consciousness. It's a simulation. It's a matrix, whatever. These beings that my family have seen, they're like the programs of the matrix that maintain life, evolution, right, but in, in, peace. But you don't, when you use matrix, it's not like a technology. No, it's, it's not more, technology. It's, it's like what you're it's talking about. It's the natural technology. It's, it's, it's life. It's, it's creation. It's consciousness. Uh, con- yeah, it's consciousness. It, yeah. it, it transcends materialism and, and, and like electronics. Those are cheap imitations. And the farther you go into technology and tech, I should say technocracy, the farther you get away from the true natural source of life, power, energy, whatever. Um, I believe this is a consciousness matrix and you are reincarnating here. I am too. We're all doing it together. Don't be afraid. (laughs) (laughs) You are reincarnating as many lives as it takes to um, basically free your energy from its physical form. And you do that. Like when you're in this physical life, you're only observing knowledge through the five senses. And then like you think things and we've been taught with a materialist worldview that your thoughts are just like inside your brain and they're neurochemical impulses, but they're not as above. So below the true reality is your mind. It's your spirit. It's your thoughts, whatever you don't, you don't necessarily know yet how to sense with your thoughts. You're sensing with your five senses. So you think all this out here outside of your body is what's really real, but it's not, it's all manifesting from your true internal consciousness, your archetype, your mind, whatever. The farther you go into your mind and understand, like through meditation and things like that and, and, and altering your consciousness, um, the farther you go into that, the closer you become connected to the collective consciousness. The, like, like the whole fractal thing you were talking about, like how thing. everything yes. is shared consciousness. You, you, the more psychic you become as you meditate more and, do, and, and become closer to your, it's basically like this weird inverted thing. Like, watch Midnight Gospel, bro. Watch the end of Midnight Gospel. It's he one literally, of my shows. he really has a Metatron's cube in in the episode where what happens to Clancy at the end. I'm sorry if this is a spoiler, but he literally. Oh wait, spoiler alert! Spoiler this is alert! The, spoiler yeah, alert! The last episode. Yes. Yeah. He goes into his mind. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 metaphor. Yeah. Duncan Trussell's smart, man. Oh, he's he has a, yeah, he has he has like awesome. two or three Metatron's cubes in this episode, right? Yeah, yeah I think yeah. I think he did that to awaken people. I, th- I, I think he I think he was trying to expand people's consciousness. He's he's smart. And so, okay, so the the reincarnation thing that's that's the purpose. You know, we reincarnate over and over until I mean, what's the ultimate? How do you? Well, the Egyptians call it the field of reeds, right? Like. This is metaphor. Back to the Egyptian. This is, yes, this is not literal. This is metaphor. What they said in ancient Egypt is, and this is episode five of the Midnight Gospel. Oh, it's, which is my favorite episode. Oh, dude, it's the Annihilation of Joy is what it's called. That, oh my God, I watched it like four times. It is my favorite it's episode. It's Alex's favorite too. It is profound. It, it, it's so profound. I texted Duncan. I was like, oh my God, this is one of the most freaking profound things I've ever seen. I cried the first time I watched it. I did. It was just, it moved me. Mind blowing. Yeah. And um, anyway, so the point of it is. The field of reeds, you said? Yes. The field of reeds is an Egyptian myth. And it's like, you keep reincarnating until your heart is as light as a feather. But it's a metaphor. You, your heart doesn't get grabbed right. by some being <laughs> right. and thrown on a scale when you yeah. die. They'd have to dig your grave up, and then they'd have to, like, <laughs> you know, evade the, the police logis- at night. The logistics of that. The logistics of that are insane. <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's energy, right? Like, your real mental being is the real you, and then all this is, like, you know, it's, it's like VR goggles, whatever. Well, well, then how do you make your heart... By learning to make peace with your suffering, your traumas, being good to other people, being good to yourself, just aligning your mind with that positive force. Most people can't do that. Most, most people don't even believe it's real, let alone, you know, think about aligning with um, the power of positivity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote one of my favorite movies, Interstellar. It's love, Tom. It is. It's love. It's yeah, love. It's love. You got to learn love. <laughs> Matthew McConaughey. And dude, this is going to sound cheesy, but Jesus, Jesus nailed it. 
bro. He nailed it. That party animal, he got it, dude. <laughs> Faith, hope, and charity. Hope of a positive future. Faith that there is like a positive outcome higher power i love it charity do good things for other people Ugh. if you if you live by those three things i think that you will free your energy from this whatever what's illusion more, we're in what's more important than being good to yourself and the people around you well dude bro so think about it think outside of the box what did jesus say there are only two laws the older abolish the two laws are love yourself i mean excuse, well i just i just spoiled the punchline but <laughs> <laughs> crap there goes my comedy career. Yeah, yeah, wrap anyway, it up. It's yeah. over. Anyway, so the two laws that Jesus <laughs> spoke about were love your neighbor and love God. But if you understand the esoteric perspective, we are all those fractal pieces of God. We're all small pieces of God. Just like the just like the the So all of us together are God. Like we yes. we Yes. Yes, that's like the, what the Buddhists are saying, that's what the Hindus are saying, essentially different cultural Oh, so then verbiage. so then you're saying that means The true meaning of what Jesus was saying was be good to yourself and be good to others because God is within you. Oh, bro, dude, within you're, everybody. You're, you're pulling it out of me now. Yeah, what was the Gnostic scripture? Rolling. The Gnostic book, the Gospel of Thomas, which is like the most prolific gospel, Gnostic text. Jesus literally says the kingdom is within you. Dang. It's it was there you. all along. God, God is within you, not without you. It was your, there all along. Yes, your consciousness is connected to the source. It's not, dude. It's not like how we're raised. It's not like there's a there's a there's a external power. We're taught that and we're controlled that way. But Jesus nailed it. He's like, don't take a master, don't take a rabbi or a teacher. You don't need one. God is inside of you. The kingdom is inside of you. You are God. So epic. Basically. And you know what's sad, bro? Like, most people are going to listen to this and think that's blasphemous. Yeah, and I mean... It's a beautiful thing. It's like... You're, you're kind of programmed, like, to, to feel that way. Because, I mean, look, I'm, I'm 27 now, uh, and I was raised the first, like... I mean, at least at least 17 or 18 years of my life, I was, you know, raised... My whole family is very devout Christians. And, like... But I also want to be clear that there's a lot of really positive things that oh for sure being a part of that community instills in you, especially at a young age. I mean, it 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 instills morality in you, and 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 so that's great. But I mean, the 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 negatives seem to far outweigh the positives ultimately. Yeah, at the end of the day, man, like I I, I think collective consciousness is on the path to a a, a big awakening. Like every new age, every couple thousand years. There's a huge shift in humanity. I just think we're at the cusp of that. Um, it's what the beings told my dad. They said, you know, we're approaching the age of Aquarius. There is going to be a deception about aliens and all this stuff. But at, at the end of the day, love will win. It was written. It was written long ago that love and light will win. It's, it, Wait, it might suck for a while, but it will win. What more of a positive way to end this episode than love will win? Heck yeah, dude. Let's say it at the same time. <laughs> Now you have to do it. I've got to. One, two, three. Love, Love will win. win. Bye, guys. Weird things happen in the backyard of Bledsoe House. See it? Oh, bro. This is the sin. Here we go.